Hello everyone and welcome back to my Baggammon channel. Today I'm joined by a very special guest who is the CEO and founder of Baggammon Galaxy. He's the author of three best-selling Baggammon books. He's been twice on the Baggammon Giants list and often plays the PR of Below 3. I'm very pleased to announce Danish Grandmaster Mark Olsen. Hello sir. What's up Dan? <laughs> nice to be here. Thanks for the invitation. Thank you for being here today. So um, today we're going to just talk about kind of Mark Olsen, how he got into backgammon, like who is Mark Olsen? You know, what's his philosophy on backgammon? What can he teach us about the game? I'm super excited to have you on the channel, Mark. Um, how did he get into it, this beautiful game? How did he start for you, the journey? Uh, I started playing when I was 17. Uh, I was still in high school and uh, it was right around the poker boom. So poker was everywhere. It was on TV. We had this huge poker star from Denmark, Gus Hansen. And I heard that he was a backgammon player. And my uncle, Frank Brockman, I, I knew that he actually became uh, won the silver medal in the Danish backgammon championships like in the 90s. But I never really talked about the game with him. But then when I started playing poker and I... I started playing with my uncle and I kind of get into the game that way. And the thing about the Copenhagen, my home city, is that at least at that time, I guess it's still the case, but even more so back then, there was a large uh, cafe tournament scene. Like almost every day of the week, there was a new cafe tournament. So you go, I started going to these cafe tournaments and uh, I happened to play against world class players literally because that's, that's the play, that's, that was the community there. You know, it was. My first ever tournament, I played against Tim Grunbeck in the final, <laughs> and he's like a Giants of Backgammon, you know, on the Giants of Backgammon list. Uh, so I immediately got exposed to these uh, super high level players and and got into this uh, backgammon community, basically. And then I, yeah, I just never stopped. <laughs> <laughs> so you started at a very high level, and Danish, um, well, Denmark has a, a really good scene of high quality backgammon players what what do you think it is about danish culture that kind of creates these these grandmasters is there something kind of special about the, it yeah there, there are some factors uh one factor is um there was something called carlsberg cup so the, the beer carlsberg uh they set up this nationwide backgammon tournament and it ran for years uh, in the 90s and that was a big recruiting uh it, 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 yeah, it recruited a lot of, of, of backgammon players, you know, so the backgammon, uh, the Danish backgammon federation grew a lot and it got a lot of members. Um, another factor is that, that, that the fact that the country is a small country, like, so geographically, everybody are close to each other, mm -hmm. uh, which means that you can meet up and play. And then I think uh, a third and perhaps the most important factor is that for whatever reason, there was this group of crazy gamblers who traveled to New York in the 90s just to play backgammon for money and they just brought back uh, a lot of knowledge and inspiration to the rest of the community i think so quite early on we had the best of the best and that kind of like spread out uh to the rest of the community so we at, at least i think for the 90s and the early 2000s maybe even up to 2010 or so but Den denmark was definitely the strongest backgammon nation on the planet it might still be but you know now you also have the japanese and the americans are catching up and you know so <laughs> now there's a lot of good nations around right now it's but we were we were early in that sense and i think i i i really uh took advantage of that as a young uh Begavon player uh just mm. because there were so many good players around me and, and then i met sander you know who was probably <laughs> the best player in the world at that time and he wasn't he was just like a few years older than me and that was crazy because maybe I was like 17, 18. It was quite early. And uh, I remember playing at a cafe tournament. And then my friend Henrik, Henrik Bang, who, by the way, won the Nordic Open twice. He said, oh, that guy over there, he's probably the best player in the world. I was like, that guy? He was like three or four years older than me. And there, there was Sander, you know. And then, then I became good friends with Sander. So, so how, yeah. How did you feel then to follow in their footsteps and win the Nordic Open in 2014? Was that like a, a huge moment in your kind of backgammon journey? Of course it was. Uh, that I think the Nordic Open had the reputation of being the strongest tournament in the world, especially because of the Nordic players, not just the Danes, but also the Swedes and the Norwegians. 
and the Germans, you know, it's so, so the field was super tough. It wasn't the biggest tournament. I think, I don't remember exactly how many players it was, maybe like a hundred and some, I don't think a hundred or 130 or something like that. So it wasn't the biggest tournament, but it was a very strong field. And uh, the thing was that uh, I, I, I actually didn't play many backgammon tournaments back then because I was still a football player. Mm-hmm. So I always had matches in the weekend. I couldn't go to these tournaments. So even though I was like part of the backgammon scene, and I was already a, a well-known player at that time. I, I don't remember if it was my first Nordic Open. It, it might have been actually, maybe my first or second or something. So it was also a little bit lucky that I, I won the whole thing. I didn't have many tries at it. So, yeah. <laughs> and so you played for Bronsby um, back in the day. So you were a successful midfielder, right? Was your position? Yeah, midfielder or attacker. Mid- uh, I, I wouldn't say that successful, but somewhat successful. <laughs> <laughs> and what and what happened? Um, how did you make the transition um, between football and, and backgammon? Um, well, football was my life when I was uh, growing up and as a young adult. Uh, the, the thing was that I, I dealt with a lot of injuries, groin injuries. Mm-hmm. Uh, and um, so I, I got injured when I was barely 18 years old. And I spent three, uh, two and a half of my first four years as a senior player being injured. Um, so that, I mean, I wasn't a pretty good trajectory. I had a lot of talent, um, but it was just difficult to overcome all those injuries. And then when I finally recovered, uh, I did make a reasonably good comeback. Uh, I played in the best league in Denmark for maybe the biggest club at that time, uh, and, uh, and then I got injured again. You know, so, and then I had to start all over. I, I went down to the first division, which is the league below. And then I got a pretty decent career there uh, as a division player. And I, I was a full-time player. Uh, and when I was 24, I decided to to stop being a full-time player and start studying economics uh, in the University of Copenhagen. Mm-hmm. Just because, you know, it, it, I couldn't get back to that trajectory where it would be really fun. You know, I was just a grinder making <laughs> some money, but nothing, I mean, nothing special at all. Uh, so so I, I just shifted gears there and started to study instead. And in the meantime, you know, Bagamon had been in my life as the secondary thing uh, all this time. You know, when I couldn't play football, then I just played Bagamon. Mm-hmm. Uh, one thing I failed to mention before is that back then you also had online gaming. So I was playing for money on Play 6.5. And that was a big motivator as well to become good at that game, I would say. <laughs> so, I mean, I was, I was partly, I was a football player, but I was always a gambler. And I also played a little bit of online football. Yeah. So I was like building my bankroll and, gambler <laughs> and, and going, uh, training in the afternoon and playing matches in the weekend. <laughs> so, so yeah. had you not been for your injuries, um, we might not have the Galaxy or UBC. Maybe, <laughs> maybe that wouldn't have happened, you know. It probably wouldn't have, to be honest, probably wouldn't have. Do you think the similarities, though, between football and backgammon? Uh, obviously, there are some similarities because it's it's a it's a field of competition where you have elite performance and all that stuff. But there are big differences. It's a completely different mentality and skill set required to each of the two. Football is a physical sport. It's all about muscle memory and physical condition. And of course, you gotta have like some sort of innate talent in terms of your nervous system or nerve system, like how or you know, what's called nerve neurology. You know how how well you're coordinated and stuff like this. How good your technique is. Um, but when you go on a, on the football field, it's all about muscle memory. You gotta switch your brain off. You know, if you think you're you're one <laughs> step behind, you know, you you have to act like instinctively. You just like gotta let your body do the work. And in backgammon, it's completely the other way around. You know, you, you have, even though there's also like instincts and pattern recognition, at least when you come to the highest level of performance, you, you, you cannot switch your brain off. You got to think and be concentrated all the time. And it's, it's much more, I mean, obviously it's a mind game, right? It's a skill game. Yeah. Uh, so I would also, the, also the, the, the nature of the game where football is, you're in control of it somehow, where by gammon, you're not in control of the results. <laughs> it's the dice, right? So... <laughs> Yeah, so yeah. you seem like quite driven and focused, determined. I mean, have you have you always been like that since a young age? Where, like, where do you get that from, that kind of drive? 
Uh, I think growing up in an like this uh, competitive elite football environment, you become competitive. Yeah. Maybe it's also some personality trait. I don't know uh, yeah. that I'm born with. Who knows? Uh, <laughs> but uh, obviously, I'm driven. Yes. But I'm not, it's not really something I think about, you know, I'm just finding a way, you know, the same with the Gammon Galaxy. Mm -hmm. It's not like a regular job, you know, you, you just, I'm just trying to find a way with my team. You know, I have a great team around me. Wilson uh, is a fantastic uh, art director and graphical designer to, uh, uh, is, is amazing at running the, the web shop. Uh, Cosign is doing all the customer support. And so we have a good team, you know, and not, not even to mention that all the developers uh, but it, it's not this typical career where you're put, putting a position and then you're told what to do and you learn and you, it's just like finding a way, you know, <laughs> <Finding> your <laughs> so way. I, I'm not even thinking about being driven or not. This is just what I do. We've been trying to find the best way to grow galaxy, to make cool products, to just do whatever we can. And yeah, it's difficult to make money, you know, <laughs> so you gotta be, you gotta work hard, work hard, think, yeah. And, yeah, be innovative and, and stuff like this. Fab. Let, let's talk more about um, Galaxy later. Let's talk about um, Grandmaster status. So, you know, what's it like to be a Grandmaster? You know, how did you feel when you when you were awarded GM status? Um, talk, can you talk a bit more about, about that? Um, yeah, I don't know why I'm laughing. It's like, I heard this interview recently with Johnny Depp with... Uh, <laughs> With, with, you know, all this Amber Heard case was going on. And then I found an interview with him on YouTube and I watched it. Uh, and, and the interviewer asked him about something about being a serious actor and stuff. And he also just started laughing because he says, like, you can be a, an actor, yes, but a serious actor, uh, you're doing something wrong if you think you're a serious actor. Something like this, it triggered some. And this is a little bit the same when you asked me about this and being awarded the Grandmaster status. I don't know why it's like, uh, uh, <laughs> Why am I laughing? <laughs> I guess it's because uh, uh, the gammon is, it's like, first of all, I already felt like a grandmaster before I got this title. <laughs> and I knew, I, I mean, you kind of know, that's right. For instance, I knew Falafel was fantastic at backgammon, much mm -hmm. better than I was. You don't have to give him, give him a diploma or whatever. You just know <laughs> right, by playing and interacting. Uh, and I think there is this hierarchy among the players. Um, and then you get all of a sudden, you got this BMAP federation coming out and, and starting giving titles. And I, I, I am a great BMAP fan. Don't get me wrong. I think it's great. And I'm also proud of my grandmaster title, but it's just so difficult in backgammon. There's so many variables involved, uh, you know? So <laughs> I, I guess BMAP is the best we've got. Yeah. And it measures this error rate uh, average error rate and, and obviously like Mochi is number one on BMAP, Mochi is the best player in the world. No question about it, yeah. right? It takes skill to, to get there, you know, but, uh, I, somehow I think that there's more to the game. Um, like there's varying, uh, performance levels, like for instance, Falafel, Falafel had a turbo and he called it the, the turbo. And when he, when he pressed the turbo, he was outplaying everybody. But if you just tracked his, all of his games, you know, throughout an entire week of a tournament, maybe he wouldn't rank in the top three of the DMAP, you know, because sometimes he's, he, he gets tired, you know, he falls asleep in some matches, literally falls asleep <laughs> at the board sometimes that happened often. Uh, and, uh, yeah, you know, so that is, how do you measure it? Do you measure your top performance or do you reward consistency or, uh, how do you how do you deal with this fact that you have some easy matches and difficult matches and do you feel you know, a kind of pressure having that title where you have to consistently perform at a high level no not at all mm -hmm. first of all because i think that uh, the 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 titles are quite easy to obtain like i think at the moment group uh grandmasters like 4.0 over 250 experience points or something like that which is like super easy like <laughs> if you're really high level it's it's nothing right i mean i'm not just i'm arrogant here if you play below four you're a really really good player but you know there are kind of levels to it you know mm -hmm. there's a huge difference between like a mochi or a michi or somebody who played 3.9 and just made the cut you know it's like exponentially mm -hmm. more difficult to get 
to grind it down. Yeah. yeah, to grind it down, right? Um, yeah, so so the the grandmaster status from uh, from BMAP, I think that's one of probably one of the best titles you can get. I think it's also good to become a, a giant of backgammon, uh, even though it's a little bit America American centric. Uh, the vote, um, it's it's not the same, you know. It's not like just this hardcore subjective measure, but it still tells you something where you're popular or people respect you or something like this, you know. I think that's pretty good as well. BMAP is probably better, but uh, I think both titles are pretty good. I think uh, UBC results are very important um, because, you know, that's when you, if you go to a BMAP tournament or you go to the UBC, it's kind of similar, but not really, because in the BMAP tournaments, it's more like friendly, collaborative by Gamma. It's like, okay, I split with 2-1. And then you also split with two one, and then we're trying <laughs> to keep it simple, and we play holding games, and you know, I, I double here at first opportunity you take, and it's kind of like playing against the computer. Mm-hmm. Uh, whereas in the UBC, it can get a little bit more messy because you have that outplay thing. You know, you you trying to win points, uh, but you're also trying to play a low average PR. So it it's kind of. Um, but what I like about the UBC is like it's once a year where all the best players show up and compete, and this is when you gotta be in prime. Uh, condition you know it's not three months later where you play a small tournament somewhere it's now you know so there's this competition element to it uh that i think is fun mm. uh you said yeah, you know but uh, <laughs> you yeah. said the ubc you got the idea from paul mcgrill is that is there some truth in that um creating a tournament uh, or yeah there's some truth to that there's some truth to that you know, is this, I mean, I'm not saying the UBC is perfect or anything, but I think it's not, we are not the first to come up with the idea of some sort of skill-based world, world championship or whatever you want to call it, grandmaster championship or something like this. And, but the thing is like getting the format right. That's not, a, that's not so trivial. Yeah. Uh, we had the, in the Danish Begammon uh, scene, we had a tournament called, or actually still has, I, I won it. I don't remember what year I, I wanted once, but it's something called XG masters. Mm-hmm. And, uh, it's kind of similar to the UBC. So maybe that's the, the main, the, the biggest inspiration, I think to the UBC, uh, the, the format in that is that you have three points awarded per match, one for winning the match, one for the PR win and one for the player who gave away fewer match winning chances presented match winning chance percentages. Um, so you have three, but, but that seems when we kind of analyzed it and, and, uh, it, it seems a little bit too heavy on the skill side because mm-hmm. now you have two out of three points being awarded to the skill. And we also try to analyze what's actually a better metric. Is it the PR or is it the match winning chances? Mm-hmm. And there are kind of pros and cons to both of these uh, metrics, but we e- eventually realized that PR is way better than, uh, than match winning chances because match winning chances is a function of uh of the dice yeah. to a very large extent like the luckier you are the easier it is to to lose match winning chances mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and uh, if you're not very lucky because when every time it's like the gammon match you start at 50 percent match winning chance and we play until one of the players go up to 100 percent, and the other guy goes to zero and uh every time you go up you how can you go up by the way well you can you can go up in match winning chances if you get good dice or if your opponent makes mistakes that's the two only ways because if you just play perfectly you you just stay and where you are you know it's when you make mistakes then you go down and your opponent goes up so that's the two only ways to gain equity or gain match winning chances which means that the luckier you are the more match winning chances you have to give away so the player who gets better dice he gets up he has a lot of match winning chances when he makes a blunder it's a bigger drop the guy who's already down to five percent match winning chances first of all there's a cap he can only throw away five percent that's the maximum but even if he threw, throws away half of the match winning chance, it's still just two and a half percent. So the one who gets luckier throws away much more match winning chances. Uh, and uh, and also we also had this thing where uh, the match winning chances is very heavy in the uh, to skewed towards the important games. So for instance, the double match point in a seven point match. If you make a mistake there it's like a five or 10% drop in match winning chances. If you make a big blunder, if you made the same blunder in the first game at zero, zero, it's perhaps 1% match winning chances. Mm -hmm. So it, it, 
the game is the, the match winning chance game is decided in the final games, mm -hmm. which seems a little bit. I mean, you could argue that well, that's what that's the objective truth. That's where it's really important. But you could also argue that errors are kind of randomly distributed, and it's a little bit random when you make the the errors. Uh, so it seems a little bit harsh to pe penalize one blunder here five or ten times as hard as it would be at zero zero, where PR just normalizes it. It says this error it counts for the same PR wise, no matter what game you make it in. So I think. PR is a better metric if you want to measure skill. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's how we came up with uh, with using PR rather than match winning chances. And it seemed that 50-50, like one point for match winning chances, for those of you guys who don't know the UBC format, you get one point for the match, meaning the match, and one point for winning the PR battle. And it seemed like a, a good, uh, simple, also simplicity is, is a... Is a very important feature it has to be simple rules yeah if it gets too complicated people don't understand it and uh, like simplicity is a great virtue yeah. in terms of something like this so for those of you who are not familiar ubc you can watch the matches on galaxy's channel uh, the streaming quality is exceptional the best streamed backgammon matches and fantastic commentary by nick blazier and other guest commentators. Um, how did you feel, Mark, about um, doing the UBC, actually participating in it? What was it like kind of preparing? I mean, how, how do you prepare, you know, for tournaments in general? What do you kind of focus on? What do you look at? Yeah, good question. I mean, uh, I guess when you get up to like grandmaster level, it, it like, performance becomes important it's not just about knowledge it's also about being able to perform and play well mm -hmm. uh, and that's the trick you know so we've had three ubc tournaments so far 19 20 and 21 no sorry how was it 19 20 i don't remember was it 20 20 i don't know we, we've had three of them so <laughs> we just had one yeah. uh, two months ago uh so i've only I've, I've played in all three myself even though i'm kind of like the tournament organizer um but usually what is what happens is that we have the staff there and then i just let go of all my obligations on the day <laughs> of, uh, of play um the first two years i played and another thing is we, we analyze the matches with XG++ analysis, which is a harsher analysis than mm -hmm. the BMAP analysis, which is the world class. So it's just apply and XG+. So you play on average like 0.15 PR points low, uh, worse with the UBC analysis mm -hmm. because it's so extensive. And uh, the first year I played 3.1, which I was happy with. The second year I played 3.3. And I lost in the semifinal to Kazuki after a huge, huge, huge blunder, six, six or 700 blunder on the cube decision, uh, which cost me that. Um, and then this year uh, in Istanbul, for the first time ever, I was well prepared because the first two years I didn't, I mean, I was too busy setting up the tournament. It was stressful. I didn't sleep at night. You know, everything was just big mess. <laughs> uh, and I ended up playing reasonably well. Uh, but this year I was really well prepared. I've been practicing because we, now we have a big team down there in Turkey. We have fantastic partners with uh, in uh, FM Gammon. You know, I could really just focus on my game. And then I got sick. I started feeling bad on the first day. I was tired, headache. On the second day, I started getting fever. And like at the end of the day, I had to withdraw from the tournament because I. I I got too high a fever, you know, I couldn't play. And then I was in bed for four days in the hotel room in Istanbul. So I didn't play this well this year. Uh, but with, in terms of preparations, I've, as I said, like I didn't prepare the first two years. This year I really prepared. And what I did the most was I played and analyzed. That's always the number one thing. Play and analyze. Play and analyze. And I like to, this is something I got from a chess podcast once that, um, you got to train fast and you got to train slow. Meaning that uh, if you only play speed gammon, you never go into the deep thoughts, you know, and you're kind of not getting there. Uh, it gets too shallow. You're not improving. You're not pressing yourself to improve your knowledge about the game. But if you only play too slow all the time and really play in a very deep minded game, you're not practicing your brain muscle, you know, you're, you're too slow. Mm -hmm. So I like to vary it. I like to train fast and I like to train slow. 
And in the periods where I train fast, I only play speed. For instance, uh, <laughs> I played a, last year. I played a uh, super speed challenge against Stanek Stanek Siska, and he kicked my ass. By the way, he's fantastic <laughs> he's at speed gamma. Fantastic. Stanek. He's yeah. outstanding. And the format in super speed is you play two speed tables at the same time on Galaxy, seven point matches. Multi tabling. You play multi tabling. Yeah. Two table speed, multi tabling. You play twelve matches. It took like not even two hours. So it's like a UBC final. Uh, and and you play like this, and if you do that, and then you go back to just playing at normal time on Galaxy, it's like slow motion, <laughs> because you force your brain to think so fast. It's not like just because I'm playing speed, I'm not thinking about all the stuff I normally would. No, no, I am. I'm just pressing my brain to do it really fast. Of course, I can't go as deep to. I might compromise sometimes. I might say, okay, I'm not going to count all the shot numbers here. I'm just going to use intuition, mm -hmm. and I think this move minimizes uh the, the shot numbers or whatever but it's not like i'm compromising my strategic thought i'm thinking about all the same things i'm just pressing my brain to, to do it faster and i think that's a great way to train because then when you go back and you play normal clock it's like slow motion you feel really strongly about it what does that's the, uh, uh, good, no go ahead mark yeah okay so I said, that's a that's the mm -hmm. main thing i'm doing mm -hmm. when i'm trying to get in good shape the other thing is um, I study specific uh, situations, like, for instance, pay now or pay later from the midpoint mm -hmm. in a holding game or when to run from your 22 point anger or when to bring your co goalkeeper in a holding game to safety or when mm -hmm. to stay there or, you know, slot or not problem. All, all these specific scenarios and there are hundreds of them in back camera. I try to study them, you know, set this position up look at 30 different variations of it, uh, get a good grasp of that particular position type. So I think, I think that's my, that's my method. These two things. Yeah. What, what does analysis look like for you? I mean, do you mean just like after I play a match, how, how I review it? How yeah. I how do you review it? Like, what, can you break that down a little bit? What, like what do you yeah. do? Yeah. So, uh, usually I, I just play on galaxy. And I, I don't even bother to import it. Occasionally, I import it to Extreme Gamma to make a deeper analysis. But usually, I just use the three-ply analysis on Galaxy. And then I use the hotkeys. So I usually review all the moves of the match. Mm -hmm. But I use the arrows on the keyboard just to toggle through all the moves. So I do it quite fast, I would say. And uh, yeah, you know, you, you, it's best to not make any mistakes. But sometimes you make a mistake and you try to figure out what went wrong. And I think... At my point now, it's I, I almost never see a begammon position where it's like I don't know what's going on. You know, mm -hmm. I've studied so many positions, so many times. So I, I always kind of know what my error was, and sure. it's it, it's more a matter of you know putting your getting your aim right. You know, it's <laughs> it, it's more a matter of that than it is to understand a whole new. Uh, concept or whatever but but that's something i think is unique because when you get to grandmaster level maybe that's the case but for all the other players it's it's actually more about trying to if there is a leak in your understanding where you don't you, you don't understand this position okay that's not so good let's try to study it then try to take this position put it into xg put up 20 variations post it on pagamma strategy on facebook ask other players around it how can i categorize this position what type of decision was it uh yeah you know then you've got to do some investigation work and i think it's it's quite rare i i do this these days it's more about ah i should i undervalued this concept or i i didn't remember which thing had higher priority or something like this you know um it's more like that, I think. Mm. You mentioned there the um, the forum um, on Facebook, Bagaman Strategy, um, which is a great resource for learning. Um, people post on multiple positions each day. And, and you get a whole host of comments, some arguably better than others, I, I, I would <laughs> argue. Um, so look out for the kind of group expert um, badges, you know, when you do that. That's right. How do you... You know, how do you go about kind of deciphering, you know, the good from the bad? You know, like if you're more like an intermediate player, how do you kind of see the wood through the trees? That's a good question. 
uh, oh, that, that has multiple layers answering that question. So one way would be what I would say is, uh, the most important, if you're an intermediate player, it's the key is, I think at any given backgammon decision or position or decision, you, you need to have like a, an idea, you know, it, you, you're not just making random moves. So even if you read a comment for somebody who's perhaps not a grandmaster and maybe he's writing about the wrong idea, at least he has an idea. If there's an argument there, it's worth noticing. Um, so I think it's a lot about listening, even just listening to people's argument. You, mm -hmm. you can gain a lot from that because they, they, they might talk about features that you hadn't noticed. Right. And it's a lot about this. I think one of the things where as you get better at backgammon, it's, it's actually getting better at feature detection. Mm -hmm. So yeah. if you're a grandmaster, there isn't really any features of the position that you're missing. You might be misevaluating him, but you, you didn't miss out the, the fact that you had split back checkers and you're facing a blitz formation or something like this. Yeah. Whereas if you're less sophisticated, you might only see two or three of the features of the position where maybe there's like six or seven important features here. Yeah. Uh, so even just expanding your mind, to your pattern recognition to see more features, I think is useful. So uh, it, it's always useful to, to post on, on the strategy uh, for on Facebook and listen to what other people say. And of course you have uh, better experts than others. And if you can decipher who that is, listen more to them. Uh, and then usually what happens in these uh, threads are that um, some person posts the answer after 24 or 48 hours. So, mm -hmm. so you, you will eventually get the feedback, which is the most important thing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Is it, would you say there's a hierarchy of ideas in backgammon? You know, <laughs> do, you, yeah. do you think so? I think so. Uh, okay, so now we get stepping into the backgammon philosophy yeah. area, which is great. I love it. <laughs> um, so, okay, so first I want to start by saying a mochi quote. There are many ways to dice and slice a backgammon position. And what he means by that is that it's all about making good moves. And usually there are many ways to think that can find you the best move. I would argue that uh, some ways are better than other. For instance, if it's a, if you have a way where you can explain it to someone less sophisticated and now they can go and make the best move. I think that's a, that's a powerful way of looking at the position. If you have a way where you, you're, you're a grandmaster and you can make the best play, but if you, you, you can't really articulate it to someone else and they can't go and reproduce it, then maybe it's not as, it's not as simple and powerful somehow, but you know, for you, it's okay. It's, I mean, people find, I mean, the best example is probably Sandra Lilock. He's probably the second best backgammon player in the world after Mochi, but you know, his, it's just his pattern that, uh, recognition is just outstanding. You know, he just feels it, you know, he just feels where the checkers mm -hmm. must go, but he doesn't really have much experience in articulating it and categorizing it. Mm -hmm. My game is completely the opposite. I map out everything. I structure everything. I, I want to deduct the strategy rules in each, uh, edge case scenario. So, and also because I write books, you know, so, so I, I have more experience in, in, in I've, I've spent some of my backgammon time by figuring out what's the most effective way to explain this idea. Uh, so maybe I'm more experienced by that, where, where somebody like Sander was spent all of his time just competing at high stakes. That's mm -hmm. it. You know, it's, it's a, it's a selfish thing. You know, you want to be the best. Whereas if I, it's also a selfish thing for me to write <laughs> books because I get, I make money on it and I, it's, it's great pleasure, you know, but I, I, that's that game is more about trying to find good ways to explain something. I think Michi is really good at this as well, mm -hmm. uh, at deducting the simple rules and giving it to someone less advanced. And now he can apply it over the board. Mm -hmm. This idea of like hierarchies for sure there, there is a hierarchy in backgammon, but it's difficult. It's, it's sufficiently complicated this game that there isn't just one algorithm. It's like different position types or diff requires different toolboxes or different ideas. 
-hmm. So for instance, Sander, he talks a lot about, uh, you got to have the right idea over the board. And he's always criticizing me if I don't have the right idea, you know? And then I ask him, but well, how, how do you know which idea is the right one? And that, maybe that's more difficult to answer, right? <laughs> but, but, you, so, but there's some truth to it. If you you got to apply the right idea over the board. But it seems that it, in, in some positions, for instance, so, so for instance, uh, Pure Strategy, my second book, I explained some of my philosophy, some of my fundamental philosophies. And it was basically a book about two ideas. One was the ideas about game plans, how that works in backgammon. So this idea, you have four game plans, prime, blitz, race, and then the fourth one, which I like to call contact. Some like to call it hitting a shot or what, but basically the idea of hitting a late turnaround shot and then winning the game from there. If everything else fails, like back games, holding games, deep anger games, uh, split back checker, no anger, holding games and single checker holding games. That's basically the contact variations. Um, so that was the main idea of pure strategy. Explain how these four game plans work. How, what's the dynamics of this game? And this knowledge is very useful in a lot of checker play decisions. Not all, but some, some, if you know, if you understand the game plans, it will give you the best play in many situations. Mm -hmm. For instance, if your opponent rolls an early double five, now he has a blitz formation. He has 10 in the zone because he's, oh, sorry, sorry. If, if your opponent rolls a double five after you haven't split your back checkers, so he cannot make a blitz attack, he's forced to play 13 to three with two checkers. Mm -hmm. Now he has 10 in the zone and he's impure and he's stacked. He doesn't have builders to come from behind. He's very poorly placed in a priming game plan. Yeah. But he's great in a blitz attack. <laughs> so you shouldn't split your whatever you roll don't split your back <laughs> good advice you know? yeah that's like one specific but if you understand the game plans like now he has a blitz formation you know he's very strong in the blitz attack here you are behind in the race you need the prime to win because if you don't get a prime he can just get freedom and now you're going to lose the race so priming is very important when you're behind in the race and it's also the best game plan when your opponent is is too far advanced that is, he has a blitz formation. The best way to punish a blitz formation is to build a strong prime and let have him crunch. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so this dynamic with priming, blitzing, racing, and contact, that was like, that's like the game plan aspects to the game. If you understand that, and this was one of the main ideas of pure strategy, this will give you the best play in many situations, but not all. Mm -hmm. Then you had the other idea in pure strategy. That's the more the idea of concepts where in some positions you don't need to think about game plans. It's, it's obvious, you know, it's more about figuring out is play A or play B better. And with that, we, we rely on principles or concepts, concepts like efficiency. That's the, the checker utilization. I would think maybe it's a better word, but Bill Roberti called it efficiency in modern backgammon, which is where I learned it from. I picked up this term and it's, I think maybe the number one backgammon concept, you know, utilize your checkers to the maximum. Don't <laughs> have stacks. Don't bury checkers. Don't put checkers past points you want to make. All that stuff. Uh, what other concepts do we have? Purity. Purity is uh, you want all else being equal, you prefer to play pure. Sometimes you deviate when you go into a blitz attack. You can play impure, but purity, very important concept. Flexibility, yeah. super important. Uh, freedom with the back checkers. I think that's one of the concepts that I introduced in pure strategy, which which was kind of under uh, exposed. People didn't really talk about it much. You know, I actually think freedom with the back checkers is one of my four main concepts. It's fundamental. Yeah. And uh, I recently saw a, uh, a very nice lecture by Ken Golding uh, on YouTube. I think it was for the Women's and Backgammon Federation. Mm -hmm. And he talked about his, um, his uh, evolution of his game throughout the 70s and 80s and stuff like this. And he said that the moment he realized that Bagamon is a beauty contest, he started winning more matches. And then he <laughs> kind of defined what is a beautiful move. And then he said, for instance, you want to be flexible. You don't like stacks. Uh, you want to make structure and you want to play pure. And you want connectivity, he yeah. says. Mm -hmm. uh, and for instance, the opening 6-5 might be played 24-18, 13-8. So that's kind of beautiful because you have connectivity, you unstack, 
and you bring a builder down to the eight point, it's a more harmonious spare checker distribution. And uh, he argued that maybe even back in the 70s or something, he started making this play and mm -hmm. this looks beautiful. Um, and it's not that I'm disagreeing with him. It is kind of beautiful. I just think there's a missing piece there in this beauty philosophy. Mm -hmm. I think freedom is also beautiful. And mm -hmm. that's why running all the way 24-13 is a better move because it maximizes your freedom. And when you get freedom with the back checkers, it's not just a racing thing. It's also neutralizing your opponent's offense. He's not being, he's not going to be able to prime or blitz you as well now because you have freedom with the back checkers. Uh, and the same way getting the advanced anchor early on in the game, it's so powerful mm -hmm. because you neutralize your opponent's offense. Uh, so yeah, freedom is a big concept, I think. Um, so yeah, in a lot of positions you reuse concept, right? So, so, okay. So we have the game plan, uh, aspect. We have the conceptual aspects, like which principles are we moving checkers by? And then I have a third category as well, uh, which wasn't part of pure strategy. Pure strategy focused on these two elements to it. But now I kind of feel like the third category is quite big, especially if you really want to make it to the grandmaster level. And that's situation specific ideas. Where if you haven't studied, for instance, pay now or pay later from the midpoint, like you roll a five, four, and you have the choice to clear the midpoint and leave a shot, or you stay there and you bury some checkers and you wait, you know, that's a classic pay now or pay later situation. If you haven't studied that extensively, uh, it's difficult. You, it's not going to help you knowing about game plans or concepts, you know, you got to study that specific situation. So I think that's a big one as well. You can get quite far with the first two one. It's, you can definitely get to advanced or maybe even expert level, never really studying anything specific, just having a good intuitive understanding how to move the checkers. But I think if you want to get to grandmaster level, you need some specific, some specific uh, studying as well. Or you just got to do like Falafel did, you know, just play a million games. <laughs> <laughs> and then eventually you will you yeah. will study it, you know, it's just come like just happen to come up so again and again. You mentioned <laughs> those um, concepts earlier, um, flexibility, freedom. Do you think a lot of mistakes happen because people focus too much on, oh, there's duplication here or this is a, a flexible move and they have this kind of narrow focus you know, and do, do you see what do you see what I'm trying to say there? That the I concepts would, yeah. can blind them towards a bigger picture. Uh, I I would say that that that's in the category of misapplication of concepts, mm -hmm. and this is very common because it's difficult. You know, mm -hmm. how do we like Sander quote the Sander quote? You gotta have the right idea at the right position. You know, how do we get that idea? You know it's difficult to apply the concepts correctly. And I think that's part of studying is to figure out which position types, uh, in, in, in each position type, different set of concepts ca carries a different weight. So for instance, if you're playing a mutual holding game, safety and the race are two very important concepts. Mm -hmm. You shouldn't just go about playing flexible and even shots because the race is so important right now. So we have to play safe but you get into a back game situation. Who cares about safety and the race, right? <laughs> it doesn't matter. You got to play pure and flexible and efficient. You got to use your checkers to the maximum. You cannot afford to play, make any impure plays and put checkers in deep, you know? So it's two very different position types and it's two very different concepts that we apply. How to get that right? I mean, that's, that's difficult. That's the difficult part. I think that's you know? a million that's dollar question. Study, you know? yeah. yeah. You know, you got to study it. You got to figure out, uh, which concept, I mean, the way I did it, I did it by just compiling lots of positions, create a position database, put your blunders and your errors in that position database. Mm -hmm. You can even artificially create positions in this position type. So the moment that you have a category saying uh, that that's called mutual holding games, and you have 20 blunders where you keep leaving shots, all of a sudden you start to deduct concepts yourself. You start to realize, okay, Maybe I shouldn't leave a shot. The computer doesn't like me leaving shots, you know, play safe. And that's now you've deducted something. Now you know that, okay, in this particular position type, I need to play more safe. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you just do that with maybe 20 or 30 different position categories or position types, you're going to improve a lot. You know, that's exactly how you get a grasp on, on, on these concepts. Yeah. I mean, what advice would you have for someone playing at a PR of seven or eight? 
they've played for maybe 10 years, they're not getting any better, they're getting frustrated. What do they do? You know, like how do, yeah. how do they improve? Again, there are many ways to improve. There's not a single way, you know. Um, I think some ways are better than other. Uh, first thing is you got to analyze all your matches. That's mandatory. When you play, you're, you're mindful while playing. If you're just watching TV and you're not really thinking about what you move, okay, you're not going to improve. We're talking about like deliberate practice or mm -hmm. like time spent where you actually make an effort. If you play a match, you got to review it afterwards because you need that feedback. You need to know what, what you did wrong. So that's it. That's the first thing that you got to, uh, that's mandatory, basically. <laughs> um, you could take some private lessons from a, a grandmaster, but that's a little bit of expensive way. That's not everybody who can afford that, but that's probably a very effective way to get some help. You could read books. That's also very nice. There's, I mean, there's, I mean, I still read all the animals. I always pick up something. Uh, whether it's Mitch's books or Stanyak's books or whatever, I always pick up something, some details, even just looking at the positions. So, uh, yeah, read Bagalan books is a good advice as well. That might also expand your mind of how to think about things. Mm -hmm. You might see stuff mentioned in the book that's a feature, it's a pattern that you, you, you haven't really thought about before. So your pattern recognition, uh, we're not detecting it. But all of a sudden, now that you had it articulated and presented, all of a sudden, now your pattern recognition starts to detect it. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, reading books, I think, is a pretty good one. Uh, if you like to watch the gammon on YouTube, there's a lot of good matches there with extreme gammon analysis and commentary. You know, the UBC matches, for instance. Yeah. That's another good source. Um, and then at the end, I would say, create a position uh, or a blunder database, categorize your blunders. Mm -hmm. So next time you're faced with a similar decision, you have some experience, you know, it's not just random walk, uh, whatever <laughs> you do, you know, it's so, so I think maybe that's my, my advice, Specific but there are study. many ways, you know, many ways. Um, so we mentioned books earlier. Um, so let's talk about your books. Um, now this is your first published book and um, 2015. Um, basics to badass and this is uh, a, a fantastic book um, for beginners uh, even intermediate or stronger players where you outline all those kind of concepts that you, that you kind of mentioned so tell us about the inspiration behind writing that and how you put it together yes okay actually it was written in 2012 okay and it was published in, uh, in the first edition was published in Danish in 2012 then i had one of my friends to translate it and it was published in english i don't remember the year maybe 2013 14 and the second edition that you have which is significantly better than the first edition is, i think it's from 2015. um the inspiration was kind of like making a modern version of mcgrill's began mm -hmm. because mcgrill's began book uh, is fantastic mm -hmm. Given the time it was written, it's, I mean, extraordinary. Yeah. I mean, he was so far ahead of his time. It's incredible, literally incredible. The boy boy. <laughs> yeah, it was, the, it was so, and he, and also as a player, you know, he was exceptional ahead of his time. It's, it's crazy. Uh, nevertheless, uh, I, it's not exactly the best book nowadays. You know, if you're a new player, it's quite long. It takes a long time to read. Uh, it has some strategic mistakes in it. It has blunders in the positions. And I don't even think that's the worst part. It's okay that there are some blunders in there. It's old book. But it's more about the way of, uh, yeah, the content. You know, it's, it's still a great book. It's a, it's a, it should be on the top of your list, but it's not really up to me. So, so that's kind of like what, what I felt, that there was a simpler, quicker way. You know, it doesn't need more than two pages to explain flexibility. Show a couple of positions. This is flexibility. It's better to be flexible than to be stacked and inflexible. Here you go. You know, mm -hmm. uh, so so it's it's like a simpler and more modern version of McGrill's book, I would say. Also, it, it kind of shares this idea of having. It, it's quite shallow but wide. You know, yeah. it doesn't go too deep in some. It's it's just shallow and wide, and it deals with some match 
the match strategy and some cube strategy. And so it's, it's like an introduction to not for the complete beginner, uh, but more like anyone who wants to take their game to, to the, a little bit more sophisticated level. Yeah, it gets a bit more complicated towards the end. You start talking about match equity and also your value value equation, which you mentioned earlier, right? But the the blitz and prime yes. values and so on. Um, like, how did you how did you come up with that the value equation? Like the value equation for those two guys who happen to not have read from basics to badass or pure strategy is an idea where it's not a mathematical equation. It's an idea of. Uh, having a system where we understand the game plan dynamics. So yeah, it's something like this. It says, it's basically says that the value of any of the gamma position is the sum of the relative strength in the four game plans. Mm -hmm. So you could say, you could argue that this is actually what good players do intuitively. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we, we try to compare how strong our position is. Uh, and I just like formalized it in a philosophical way, not a mathematical way, just in a, in a framework, basically a framework of thinking. And you kind of start to understand that every time you make a move, it has a different effect in these four game plans. Mm -hmm. So, so there's, there are trade-offs, uh, for instance, uh, I mean, we, we should have had a bagamon board here. I should be able to make bagamon persistence, but I let me try to just explain some. like, for instance, um, the, the double four in the second row. You can't start with a double four, but your opponent rolls whatever, he wins the opening, and now you roll double four. Usually the best play is 24, 20, 13 to nine, with two checkers each. Mm -hmm. And this is a, a, a move where it's the best move because it maximizes your value across all four game plans. If we were only focusing on priming, we would play 13 to five with two checkers to make the five point. That would be the best priming move. If we were only focusing on racing, we would play 24 to 16 with two checkers. That would be the best racing move because we're getting freedom. If we're only focusing on a blitz attack, we would play eight to four with two, six to two with two. We would make inner board points. Uh, so the best play 24, 20 and 13 to nine is not focusing on one particular game plan. It's maximizing across all four game plans, mm -hmm. even contact, because even if you go, go behind in the race and stuff, now you have a great anchor there to play a holding. So it's the, when you start to understand this dynamic between these four game plans, you kind of start to understand the game at a deeper level. This mm. is what it is really a gamma, you know, um, Bill Roberti talked about it in modern backgammon and he called it non-commitment. Mm -hmm. And I think he did a, a worthy, uh, effort in explaining this idea. And I kind of just evolved it a little bit and went a little bit deeper. But basically, Roberts's idea of non-commitment is the idea that moves that does well in multiple game plans are better than moves that only does well in one game plan. Mm. So he doesn't want to, in his words, you don't want to commit to a game plan. Uh, it's a weakness if you're committing too much to one game plan. But it's a little bit difficult because in many pagamon positions you you want to commit to one game <laughs> because it's a, so it's a you know it's mm. it's difficult to t say something in general if you're using a single term like non-commitment because it breaks down it breaks down a lot you know like any uh, role so, there's exceptions in backgammon yes sure yeah exactly exactly mm -hmm. so, so so for me i set it up more as a, as a framework or a system that allowed for this flexibility you know mm. now you want to go all in on the blitz attack that's because you have 11 in the zone and your opponent doesn't have an anchor and you can put two on the bar. This is a phenomenal blitzing attack. So we are maximizing our value across all four game plans by going all in on the blitz, you know? <laughs> so that, it's not always that non-commitment is, is a weakness. <laughs> um, yes. And the, the idea, I think uh, it wasn't, it, this idea was not in the first edition of, of From Basics to Badass. It was put into the second edition in 2015 which means that it was around there I started evolving that idea. And then when we came to, to uh, Pure Strategy, which I wrote in 2017, it was more mature, the idea. And the, another fun thing, I think, by, by writing books, I can kind of track my backgammon understanding and how I was thinking about the game at that time. <laughs> and obviously my, my understanding is evolving as well. So for me, reading From Basics to Badass, 
is almost a little bit cringy, you know, because I, <laughs> I see all of my, this was 10 years ago. Juvenile. <laughs> yeah, it's very juvenile. I was still at Grandmaster level, but I'm way better now. Like, yeah. I was probably like uh, 4.0 or slightly better at that time. And now I'm probably closer to in the lower end of the three. Uh, yeah. So so it's like I'm almost exponentially better now than I was when I wrote it. And when I see that, when I read it, I, I'm still proud of it. It's a very good book. And it's the best selling Bagaman book of recent times. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a fantastic uh, book. Yeah. Thank you very much. But, you know, I can't help reading it and, and uh, think, why didn't I use uh, this type? I, I should have used another position or I should have changed that detail or I should have... Mm -hmm. Uh, this is the prime primary argument, and I put it as a secondary argument. You know, that, that there's all these things. <laughs> uh, yeah, <laughs> it, it, that kind of chimes in with what you were saying earlier about um, the difference between, let's say, a four and a three point eight. It, it it's huge. It's it's not incremental, right? At that level, at that grandmaster level, grinding from such small numbers down is a huge amount of work. And I think, you know, you're saying there in your first book, even though you were a grandmaster, now in some ways you're a, you're a better grandmaster because, you, sure. you, you know, those, those small kind of shifts. Um, yeah. It's not like going from a 10 to an 8, you know, going from a, a 3.8 to a 3.6 is, is a different kettle of fish, right? Yeah, for sure. Maybe maybe point two PR points is doable. I would say in, in half increments, it's, half increments. it's like going from four point zero to three point five is huge. Yeah, and the same from three point five to three point zero, <laughs> it's it's huge. Uh, there is also this about backgammon and PRs that there's a lot of uh, variance in it, which makes it a little bit difficult to measure. And that's another thing that's a little bit annoying with the BMAP system, um, because there's variance in it. You might think that you play below a four, but in reality, you just had some matches tracked where you were lucky to have easier decisions. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's difficult to, to, to actually track what's your true PR error, error rate. And mm -hmm. it also varies a lot week from me. I mean, for me, if, if I put my mind to something else, let's say we are uh, planning the world championship. By the way, the Galaxy team is planning the world champ. We, we're organizing the world championship this year in Monte Carlo. Uh, so let's say that I've spent a lot of time doing that and now I come back and I have to play a backgammon match. My neurons are not as tuned as they were, you know, I need to warm up a little bit. Yeah. I need to get some games, you know, which means that my, uh, true PR is also variating. You know, it, it also has a variance depending on how tired I am. You know, yeah. that's the, that's a PR killer. External factors. Yeah. So mm -hmm. external, all kinds mm -hmm. of stuff, you know, yeah. so it's difficult to truly measure. So when we talk, when I talk about uh, being a, let's say I was a 0.0 player when I wrote from basics to badass in, in 2012, it might vary, you know, it's, it's actually impossible to track it in, immediately. That's just my subjective perception yeah. of my game. That's yeah. how I see it. And now I identify maybe as a three point two player or something like this, right? Because I know kind of like the depths, like I just know more stuff. I'm more secure in many more positions and right. yeah. So <laughs> experience <laughs> and knowledge. Yeah. Um, yes. So you talked about your second book, uh, pure um, strategy. Um, and then your third book, this one cube like a boss, which is, yes. is a fantastic book. It's, it's really unique. It's just packed full of cube reference positions and super helpful. You know, I've used it before. I've gone to tournaments, just looked up positions. And of course you can put them into XG and you can separate them by match scores. And, um, so tell us about that book, Mark, what was the idea and for that? Uh, well, I think, uh, there are two inspiration sources to that book. One was my own way of studying. I, I've never really used reference position or quote unquote reference positions all that much mm -hmm. because I found them difficult. I mean, that's maybe that's not true because of course I have ref like uh, last roll, X roll versus X roll yeah. positions. I remember that in a three roll versus three roll, you have 21% winning chance. So of course I have a lot of reference positions mm -hmm. to remember, but I've, compared to other grandmasters that I hear that they use it a lot, I never really did that. I, I, I did like, uh, I like to, I like to study cube actions in a more quantitative way. So, for instance, you have a double five blitz, and I look at like 
20 different variations of it and then i get a feel mm -hmm. and so so i think that's what's the inspiration for cube like a boss it's kind of like how i study the cube i want to know where like i want to see the features and i want to kind of know where i am i don't need a borderline take past decision because i want to remember this reference position that's not really what it's for it's about get, getting a feel for the position and being able to make educated guesses mm -hmm. so rather than showing borderline decisions i show like a clear node i will take a clear double take a clear double pass and then sometimes there's also too good to talk in there mm -hmm. that's the usual structure of the <laughs> cube like a boss uh so so just just to get you to as a reader to uh notice all the features and get like, like a clear feedback where it's kind of clear cut that now it's too early now it's good now it's a pass and, and so forth and the other inspiration I had was uh, a book called BG Encyclopedia by Kit Woolsey. Yeah. I think it was mm -hmm. Kit Woolsey. Yeah. Maybe he had a co-writer on it as well. I don't remember. But I remember reading this book uh, early on, and it was so helpful for me. The problem with this book was that it, it was not, it was a very shallow, uh, not shallow, like uh, it didn't have many pages and positions in it. It was mm -hmm. quite thin and... Uh, because the, this was back from the, they used snowy rollouts or something. So it probably took forever to roll out these positions and maybe it, it didn't have that. Maybe it had a hundred positions in it or something like this, but, but yeah, I like the structure of it. Like you get, you get to see, you get to some truth, you know, this position, this is, that, that was the first time that I saw like a structured way of the early blitz positions. Like they had the double five uh, blitz, they had the double three blitz and it gave you the answer. You know, mm -hmm. so it was kind of like using that structure as well, some inspiration there, just applying it to all other kinds of position types. Yeah, that's in the book. Why do you think people find cubing difficult? Some people don't cube aggressively enough. Some people are too aggressive. Some people cube when it's too good. Like, why? Why is that so difficult? You know, for for people, I think. Excellent question. It, I think it's because cubing has its own universe. It's a game in the game with completely different game theory. Checker play is quite intuitive. Mm -hmm. And uh, you have the compar comparison with other checker plays. Cubing is, is, uh, is a much more difficult uh, thing from a game theoretical point of view. Because it matter. It, there's a lot of features there that are not detectable on the board. Like for instance, volatility or the market losers or market gainers, depending mm -hmm. on where you are in the equity spectrum. So, so uh, a lot of people think that when you double, it's all a matter of how good your position is. And that's not true. It's just <laughs> one feature. It, it's actually, and I think that the, the professor on the subject is Dirk Shima. I call him the professor. <laughs> yeah. And his book uh, is just a masterpiece. The, the, the book he just recently The uh, Theory published. of Backgammon, yeah. yeah. The Theory of Backgammon is mm. just an absolute masterpiece. Mm. Um, he, he defines the game theory with math better, um, per perfectly, I would say. Uh, so, however, the book is, is quite difficult to read because it's math heavy and stuff. But if you are an enthusiastic uh, Backgammon student, it's a must read. Yeah. If you're an intermediate player who's looking to make some quick advances and you have backgammon kind of like this hobby and you like the strategy element of backgammon, not so much the extensive math, I probably would recommend from basics to badass rather than the than DX book. For, yeah. But for a player like me, it's the best book I've ever read, you know. But I, I also I'm 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 all, I also understand math because I'm an economics student. So for me it's not that difficult to read. Yeah. I understand if other people doesn't share that uh with me that uh, they might it might be more difficult to to read equations you know but uh dx Schumann, he defined uh, the cube game theory beautifully yeah i and had him on my the... channel actually and um he broke down some of those concepts around match score cubing and you know check out that video on my channel um i think i saw it he really really cool guy as well but you're right that yes. book is is just superb on, on cubing, everything you need to know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's this landscape where equity and volatility are kind of like, yeah, you got to navigate in that landscape, you know? And uh, the, the thing is that the more volatility you have or the more threats or market gainers you have, the, the, 
the less equity you need to double. That's simply how I explain it in mm. a simple way, that the more volatility the position has, the less equity you need, you can double more aggressively. Uh, but, and, and that's like the correlation, so there's very little volatility, you need high equity or high winning chances or whatever you want to call it before yeah. we have a double. And uh, one of the things that I learned from Dirk's book that I never really thought about before was the idea of having a, a value neutrality towards cube actions, meaning that it's not inherently good to have a double. It can actually be a little bit bad to have a double. There are actually edge cases where you make a move just to induce an inefficient cube from the opponent. Yeah. Because if you don't make this move, he doesn't have an inefficient cube. He can just continue to roll. So that's a, that was a fun thing. I never really thought about that before. Mm. You know, like it's not necessarily good to have to have a double. It it might just be a necessary condition because it might just be better to double than to not double. Yeah. But it's not necessarily a good thing. You prefer to have a more efficient cube where you're closer to your opponent's take point. But yeah, it's a it's a. I think that's why people struggle with it. There's intangibles, and it's the game theory behind it is very mathematical of course we have pattern recognition rules uh, and intuitions that we can apply and it wasn't like i didn't understand these ideas before i read the x book i did and i had ways of dealing with it over the board but now i just understand it from a game theoretical point of view after reading his book yeah i mean how important are reference positions in general um I mean, having a bank of, you know, reference positions, do you, do you think that's a really good way to improve? Well, again, the, the Muchi quote, there are many ways to dice and slice uh, programmer <laughs> positions. So I wouldn't necessarily say my way is the best, but from my experience, I don't use reference positions all that much. What I do is I study a position type. I study the features there. I get the feedback from the computer, and then I am able to navigate in that position type. I know what is weak and what is strong. So it's not that it's just memorizing one position. It's more about memorizing which features to look for in a position type. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it's, at least that's my approach. I'm not mm -hmm. saying that it's the only way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Let's, let's now talk about Galaxy. Um, so you're the CEO and founder of Galaxy. You've brought backgammon to the masses. It, you know, you can play kind of matches online. There's multiple videos, um, you know, we could talk you know, hours about that. Look it up on YouTube, subscribe, like, and, and all that. Um, so Galaxy, the journey, the name, the, the colors, mm -hmm. can you talk a little bit about how it all started? And Yeah, <laughs> uh, it started, the idea came, I think it was 2017 or 18, with me and Sander, I think it was, we were in Monte Carlo for the world championship and uh, we were just talking about it. You know, we used to have, have a play six, five back in the day, uh, the big Israeli site, which had, according to the, their Wikipedia, they had 7 million users. So wow. they were huge and it, they, they eventually went bankrupt after black Friday, which was when the U S government, uh, effectively banned online gaming. And, um, so, so we kind of felt like there's this big market opportunity, but there's no sites out there. Uh, and then the, the idea started evolving. Then in 2018, I recruited Wilson, mm -hmm. who was, uh, who I just knew a little bit from the Copenhagen backgammon community. He wasn't a serious player. He was more like a recreational player, but we were more or less same age. And he's this creative, cool dude. And, uh, yeah, I presented him with a project. And I got him aboard and he's been a key, I mean, integral part of Pergamon Galaxy's success because all of the designs, all of the colors, the, uh, you know, everything is designed by Wilson, all the animations on the YouTube channel, mm -hmm. uh, all the stream graphics on the UBC. I mean, everything is just Wilson, you know? So, um, then Wilson, so he was aboard and then we started drawing out how the, the functionality of the site, we had this idea of you need to have integrated analysis on the site. It's essential. You know, the PR is such a gamification element. That's what got me hooked to the game. You know, it's, there's a PR, you want a game, you got to get your PR as low as possible. Mm -hmm. uh, then we had the idea of the rating system. Yeah, you know, it's just started to evolve. And at that time I had an, I, I was a, uh, I was a, 
a project manager, you could say, on a software team mm -hmm. uh, doing some sports betting uh, software. And I kind of took that knowledge from I had gained from there over to starting Bagaman Galaxy because essentially Bagaman Galaxy is is a Bagaman company and it's a software company and both things are equally important. Uh, so we had to create a software team and and find a way to create the software that we wanted to create and that's very even to this day that's the most difficult part I think getting the software to perform. To have to have new features, to be uh, to have stability, not crash all the time, to be bug free, introduce new features. I mean, that's very difficult, and it's very expensive as well. So then you got to find out how to finance it, how to get investors, how to get revenue. Uh, yeah. This so I think early two thousand nineteen, we launched the current version, and we're just on the verge now to finally have. Uh, the version two ready, which been we've been waiting for this for more than a year. By the way, I'm not cutting my hair until uh, version two. <laughs> Me too. That's <laughs> Tell us about version two. I'm sure the viewers are, are hungry um, for any information yeah. about version two. So it, it, it might even be that it's out when this podcast airs. Uh, we don't know that yet, but uh, it's going to be uh, very heavily focused towards the mobile market because we. We've just seen that the mobile gaming market is way bigger than web application gaming. So uh, that we want to go mobile or at least have a mobile application to support the, the web platform. We want to be both like chess.com and um, and the mobile version or the version two is going to be different in many ways. For instance, we're, we're leaving, we're going away from the lobby system where you can create a match and you have to wait for an opponent. We're introducing automatic matching like chess.com has. Okay. So you, you just click on whatever match type you want to play, and then we find you a suitable opponent within 15 seconds. Um, and uh, this is also going to make the rating system a little bit fairer because we don't, we're not going to see this uh, uh, opponent selection to game your rating and other yeah, ways you know yeah. you just get if you want to play for racing points you got to enter the player pool and we match you up with a fitting opponent yeah then we introduce something else that's uh fun coin gambling where you can uh you can basically just it's a gamification thing you know you can build your bankroll and try to be highest on the on the lab, uh, leaderboard um what else then we have a, a feature called private matches or play a friend, which is nice where you just send, a, you create a match and you just send a four digit code to your friend on WhatsApp or messenger, whatever. And then you just put the four digits and the match starts immediately. Uh, what else do we have? Then we have some, some uh, membership features planned as well, where you can get a blunder database, you can get higher analysis settings. Yeah, you can get a bot tutor. So we have some cool features coming up. That's not going to be in the first version now that we're launching, but hopefully soon. Overall, the gaming experience is just supposed to be a much better and newer and fresher version yeah. uh, than the current version. Amazing. Is there going to be a Blunder database included in that? That's going to be a star membership feature. Okay. So that's that's only for the members. And that's probably going to be launched hopefully in the fall. Okay. This feature. Can you tell us more about the star membership yet, or is it too soon to talk about? Well, the star membership is, uh, is I think it's going to be something like a Netflix subscription, perhaps a little bit cheaper. Yeah. And what you get for it is uh, some premium features. For instance, you get uh, higher analysis on your matches. You get four ply and checker play and XG plus on your cube decisions. Mm -hmm. And then you get a blunder database, which automatically stores all of your blunders into a category that you can then open up and study. So for Amazing. instance, blitz, blitz cubes, you know, <laughs> and then you go click on blitz cube and then you see all the blunders that you have for blitz cubes. Kind of like what, we talk, what I talked about earlier, the best way to study yeah. is actually to have a blunder database. Um, what else do we have? Uh, yeah, we have other more features similar to this, like sure. cool features that the Bagaman nerd will appreciate. But maybe like the average recreational player, maybe it's not too important for them. They they're going to be able to be able to play for free. 
um, hmm. still. Amazing. And there's also going to be a, a mobile app, which is launching very shortly, right? Um, yeah, we're currently waiting for Apple to approve the app. Mm-hmm. Um, and then after that, we're going to uh, deploy it to uh, Google Play Store, so the Android version as well. Mm-hmm. And that's what we've been working on the last year. We've been developing these mobile applications to work for both Android and uh, Apple. So <laughs> it's going to be out really soon. I know that there are memes and stuff in the meme group. Like <laughs> whenever Pagamon Galaxy version 2 is going to come out. But I hope, hopefully we're there now. I, I think, you know, it's important to remember, you know, the, the huge amount of hard work that goes on behind the scenes. You know, you, Wilson, your whole team, you know, you're often working for free, um, long hours, making sure all these features are working. So, you know, if you're on the forum bitching about the site being down, <laughs> just, just you know, take a breath. You know, yeah, that's right. people are working hard. Yeah. People are working hard and we're still a small team. You know, we have four developers at the moment, two part-time, two full-time, you know, it's a small team and uh, software just takes long time, you know, especially if you want to do it properly. And, and our next goal is to have 1 million downloads. Mm-hmm. So the platform has to be rock solid. It has to be bulletproof. So it just takes time yeah. and it's expensive and it's slow, but uh, that's how you make high quality software. Of course. Um, and, you know, the interface, the board design, it's easy to use. Um, it's easy to get a game, you know, on Backgammon Galaxy. Um, you can look over your matches. I mean, it, it, it's fantastic and it's free. So there we are. You know, what else do you want? <laughs> so, yeah, um, thanks, Dan. That's right. Um, let's talk about the future a little bit. Um, so Monte Carlo uh, World Championship, do you want to, um, you're sponsoring that this year. Um, do you want to talk a yes. little bit more about that prestigious yes. event? So for sure, uh, the World Championship, um, unfortunately, Patty Rubin passed away last year, the famous uh, tournament director of Monte Carlo. She's been the tournament director of World Championship the last I think 25 years or even more. She passed away and then her husband Ron was looking for somebody to kind of help him and for the future take over uh, running the tournament. And that's when the Galaxy team uh, made this uh, collaboration with him. And we're going to be sponsoring the tournament as well, uh, alongside with acepointbackgammon.net, Bill and Terrace side, and uh, FM Gammon. Mm-hmm. Our Turkish partners, they're also going to be sponsoring the World Championship. So, uh, yeah, that's amazing. We have 150 new boards, I think. Wow. Uh, that's one of the problems with the World Championship in the past, that the boards were not up to standard. Sure. They were cheap plastic boards. So we're bringing in proper Bagamon boards. From FM uh, Gammon. New yeah. FM Gammon produced them yeah. and uh, part, uh, sponsors them as well, partly. And... Uh, and it's like a prop of a gammon board. It's even for sale now for people who are curious, they can go and check them out in the, in FM Gammon's web shop. It's called the Gammon World Championship Tournament Board, I think it's called. Mm-hmm. And it's great value for money. It's for sale at the moment for $400, including worldwide shipping. Wow. And it's, I mean, as I couldn't name a board better uh, value for money ratio right now. It's a great board. And uh, we're gonna get 150 of those shipped to Monaco uh, that's a big new change, and uh, then we're we're really improving the streaming and the content as well. We're gonna have two matches recorded. We're not exactly sure how to s- broadcast. We know that Nick Glacier is gonna do the the commentary. We're Great. flying in Nick Glacier, <laughs> and we're flying in Phil Simborg as well oh, to do cool. the secondary commentary. So he's gonna have his own little channel going on. And maybe that's what we're going to show late at night to fill out the... We're not exactly sure how we're going to plan it yet. But basically, Nick and Phil have their own um, uh, yeah, matches to commentate. Uh, so that's going to be a lot of fun. We, we're going to have XG transcription on the primary stream. We're going to have uh, like a press lounge where we're going to do interviews and stuff like this. So we're really trying to step up the quality of the World Championship. Uh, and bring it up to what it's supposed to be. You know, it's the it's the only backgammon tournament where we know who's the world champ. We know who won it. You know, it's the only tournament where you really go into the history books. You go mm-hmm. on Wikipedia, 
uh, it's it's the undisputed uh, world championship of backgammon. Yeah, it's it carries like a fifty-two year legacy. It's really important that we do a good job. Yeah, uh, I'm sure you will. Yeah, yeah, you know. So so we're really putting in an effort uh, with this tournament, and hopefully, people are gonna love it. And not just the the people there, but the entire world of backgammon, because we're gonna do all the YouTube streaming, and, and bring everybody into the world championship, and everybody's. Bring it up to something where you know other sports or games. You know they have it's it's the world championship. It's huge, mm. and it, it it is also huge in backgammon. It's just been kind of underdeveloped a little bit uh, in the recent years. So we we try to bring that up to par. Yeah, and um, you also can knock Mochi off the top spot two times world champion. <laughs> so yeah. um, you know. So uh, uh, amazing. I'm sure, you know, that's going to be a, an incredible uh, in event with obviously great streaming, commentary, fantastic matchups. Uh, you're kind of unlikely to see really, you know, in, in other tournaments, maybe for UBC possibly, but Monte Carlo really does draw the best players, you know, from around the world. Um, it does. I, Can I just say one more thing then? Yeah, yeah. For, for everybody uh, who... Because a lot of the viewers here, they're, they're not going to be grandmasters, right? They're going to be recreational players. The at backgammon tournament and even the world championship is a very inclusive event. You know, it's a great experience. It's you you will get to see all the top players like Mochi and and the likes, but it's also just a fantastic experience. And everybody can play. There's the championship division and there's the intermediate division. So it's it's there's no barrier. It's nothing. Mm. It's not an exclusive thing. Anybody can come and participate in the world championship the more the merrier i would say absolutely and people can still sign up right for these tournaments for the intermediate and the main is that correct well you you just have to show up on the day of registration there there's no pre-registration <laughs> so you just show up bring the cash to pay and it's 250 <laughs> i think for the intermediate and 1000 euro fine for the championship division wonderful and i'm also happy that you're going to be sponsoring the uk open as well, which I will be attending. Um, that's um, at the start of September. Um, so again, superb. <laughs> hopefully, yes. hopefully, hopefully you'll be there, Mark. You know, and uh, I hope so. Yeah, it's fifty-fifty. Yeah, I really hope I can make it. Yeah, I'm good friends with Tim. You know, Tim, Tim Cross, Cross. Of course, and, yeah. Uh, that's how this collaboration came up, came about. Wonderful. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and what else Good. in the future any more books in the pipeline actually yes uh, there are two books in the pipeline mm -hmm. one is called Bagaman Masterclass and it's a collaboration between me Mochi and Alec Barr and Alec is our ghostwriter. Ah. me and Mochi gave a masterclass seminar last year in Marbella oh, Spain I remember, yeah. it was a two day seminar uh and basically, we video filmed it. We gave the footage and the PowerPoint presentation to Alec. And then Alec did a masterful job in writing the book, wow. writing the lectures into a book. Ah, so cool. and that's that's it's all the script is written. We're doing the we're doing the graphical uh, out out. What do you call it? Outlay or output or whatever of the book <laughs> at the moment. Yeah. And it's, I mean, we were trying to get it ready before Monte Carlo. If it's not ready, it's at least it's going to be up for pre-sales at the Monte Carlo. Amazing. But we still have a slight hope that it might be out there. <laughs> yeah. You've been so, busy. So that's, a, that's, I mean, that, I think that's going to be a bestseller. I mean, in all humble, I mean, Mochi is fantastic. And mm. I think some of my best work as well. So I think this is going to be a fantastic book. I, it is a fantastic. I've read it. It's a fantastic <laughs> book. Can't wait. But, yeah, no, that's yeah, going to be, very that's going to be great. And then I have a, I have a script written for another one called uh, Beginner Mistakes in Backgammon. Okay. And it's uh, the, the script is written, and um, we're just waiting for the masterclass book to finish, and then we're going to start finishing that book. So maybe that's going to take another six months or something like this before that book is out. So that's the plans, at least from my behalf, uh, on the book side. The Galaxy Web Shop has done well i think the last couple of books we, we, we've been publishing stenic siska's book and stick rice's book yeah. again who, who by the way also a great book and uh i know that nick glacier is currently working on a book as well wow which i think is going to be really good uh yeah so you know there, there are some book projects here in the next year or so 
and it's wonderful. It, it's what was missing. I mean, for the last, not recently, but before the first 10 years of my backgammon career, basically people were always saying, ah, backgammon doesn't have many books, you know, there's no literature, <laughs> just, and now finally people are starting to publish books. You know, we have Michi writing great books. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And now Galaxy Webshop are publishing some books and yeah. <laughs> Finally, stuff is happening, right? It's super. And uh, it's all cool. the gammon players should read all the gammon books. It's easy to read the gammon books, and it's fun and it's useful. Yeah, definitely. You even have stuff to learn from bad books <laughs> as well. Yeah, you know. So, um, but for Galaxy Shop, um, I'll put a link in the video description. Yeah, t-shirts, cubes, <laughs> boards, books, um, loads of cool stuff. Posters. Um, also, you released a new Earth board recently, um, which is kind of like the signature kind of Galaxy board, right? Do you want to tell us I a little bit? I would say so. Yeah. yeah the, well, the new version is just an updated version with a small uh, updated details. Uh, so it wasn't as dramatic, I would say. But, you know, we have the Earth board, we have the Void board, and we have the Adventure board, which is like the small travel board. Uh, that's kind of like the, the current uh, line of models on, in the Galaxy Web Shop, where we kind of uh, implemented our own design features, like what the dimensions of the board should be, what the frame, what type of wood, what type, how should the checkers look, like all these design details, we kind of made our version uh, of best possible by Gamma board, you know, mm -hmm. so that's the void and the earth and the adventure board. Yeah. Amazing. So, and you can change the checkers, um, different yeah. colored cubes. Yeah, check it out. Galaxy Shop, <laughs> loads, loads of fun yeah. stuff. Um, Good. Um, what else, Mark, you know, about your philosophy? Do you want to add any more kind of thoughts, um, ideas? What have you uh, <laughs> I think we, we did well. I think we talked about a lot of good things. Cool. You know, Bagamon is such an interesting game. It's never ending. It's, yeah, uh, it just keeps getting deeper and deeper the more you go into it. So <laughs> at least down the rabbit hole, yeah. It's uh, backgammon is beautiful. Like, what what do you find beautiful about it? Backgammon. I think uh, well, the game in itself is an aesthetic play because beautiful plays are usually the best plays. So that's already beauty in that, I think. And we can kind of define what is a beautiful play and what is an ugly play. I also like the idea of this, uh, it's kind of like uh, practicing Zen mastery, you know, you, you, you're <laughs> playing against yourself. That's it. You're playing against yourself and it's all about achieving mastery. And I think there's some beauty to that as well. That's at least what it is for me. You know, it's a competition against other people and against myself and trying to be as good as I can possibly be. I think that's it. You know, that's what, that's what the game is. You compete against others and you compete against yourself. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I like that. Yeah. Well, Mark, um, it's been a real pleasure speaking with you, you know, today. And a huge thank you on behalf of myself and the whole Bagaman community for the work you do for Bagaman Galaxy, the videos. I mean, you, you've grown the game in, in, in such kind of profound ways and it keeps on growing, right? Um, and it's great to be part of that, you know, and have you on my channel and just hear your thoughts. Um, so thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> You're welcome, Dan. It was a great, great pleasure. I hope we can do it again and I hope to see you soon. Yeah, cool. And yeah. last thing, like okay. and subscribe to my channel. Yes. <laughs> Please. Smash the like button. Smash that like button. <laughs> Cheers, Mark. All the best. Cheers, Dan. See you thank later. you very much. Bye-bye. See, see ya. ya.